in early summer icebergs from the glaciers of greenland move out into the north atlantic the powerful deep running labrador current pushes the giant keels of these majestic fragments south through pack ice ice pans harp seals appear out of the sea to bear their young Long after the flows have melted, the icebergs drift steadily south. In the open ocean, whales rise and blow. Seabirds wheel and cry along the rock-bound coast. The puffin, a bright little bird, lends color to the rock. To this bold coast of rocky islands and magnificent headlands came the Vikings long before Columbus sailed to the western world. They were looking for lumber to build their ships, and they found it on the shores of the deep Labrador bays. Indenting the wild north coast are fjords, the equal of those in Norway, but few people have ever seen them. To the Straits of Belle Isle came Portuguese, Briton, and Cornish fishermen for cod as early as 1500. Beneath this cold sea lie the finest cod fishing grounds in the world, extending from the northern tip of the Labrador to the Grand Banks south of Newfoundland. Where the granite faces meet the sea, vegetation fights hard for a foothold. But as the open sea is left behind, wild flowers, shrubs, and forests manage to grow out of the acid soil. And in the forests, there are fur-bearing animals like muskrats and beaver. This is the land of the trapper. Thousands of square miles with only a trapper's log tilt by the water's edge or a few Indian tent stakes to show where human foot has trod. Down the inland canoe and portage routes, each spring the trappers bring their furs to the company store. Fox, mink, otter, beaver, and muskrat. In the bays and inlets of the coast, salmon are caught in gill nets. Fine fish like this are cleaned and salted down for winter use or packed for export. But the greatest single crop of the coast is cod. Salmon is salmon and trout is trout. But the word fish means only codfish. Trappers go down to the bay mouths for the summer's fishing. Newfoundland schoonermen with trap boats for tending the cod nets come north along the shore. They fork fish aboard by the ton. The job of splitting fish for salting is one that every man knows, and most of them can do it like lightning. Some catches from the sea have a very short season. During the first week or ten days of July in the quiet bays along the coast, small fish called caplins school near the shore. Simple weighted nets are cast over the school by fishermen on the shore or in boats, and then the fish are spilled out of the net into tub or boat. Like farmers making hay, the fisherman's family dries his catch in the sun, carefully turning each fish until it is properly cured. 
This is one way that food is laid away for the winter. On a hot summer day, the temperature may rise as high as 70 or even 80 degrees. Wherever fish are being prepared for export, salt is in evidence. The salt vessel is followed closely into the larger communities by the coal barge. The six to eight thousand people who live on this coast are mostly of English blood. Some of their great grandfathers came from Dorset, Devon, Cornwall. Some came from the Orkneys and the Hebrides, where life offered fewer opportunities than here. On the Labrador, some of the settlers married Eskimo women. British or part British, they are a warm-hearted, loyal people, shy, yet friendly. From season to season, their activities change, and also their dwelling places. They build their permanent winter houses in sheltered coves not far from the trap lines and stocks of firewood. In the summer, many move down to the rocky promontories near the cod fishing waters to live in summer shacks. In permanent homes or summer shacks, wherever the family goes, their dogs go with them. There are probably as many sled dogs as people on the Labrador. Most of the dogs are of husky stock and are considered work animals rather than pets. When the bays and rivers freeze, the ice becomes a highway for the dogs. The dogs are tough and strong, and when the going is good, as they say, a team can travel 80 miles from dawn till dark. The teams pull sleds called comatics. These are the trucks, buses, and trains of the northern winter. When a man goes to the woods for firewood or poles for his fish stage, he takes his team with him. Dogs can haul heavy loads of fuel, food, or water on the light, well-built comatics for miles across the snow in the severest weather. To this bleak and awe-inspiring land in 1892 came a young English doctor named Wilfred Grenfell, sent out from England by the Royal National Mission to Deep Sea Fishermen to investigate conditions among British fishermen of the Labrador coast. Grenfell knew the sea and the perilous life of seafaring people. He was so taken by these hard-working people that he determined to devote his life to helping them. He quickly saw that working from the hospital boat was not sufficient. Hospitals must be built so that the neglected people would receive proper care. The immensity of the job never daunted him. He saw that much of the future of the coast lay in the children. Means must be found to build schools and a children's home, and to open nursing stations to help those in outlying harbors. To accomplish these many projects, Grenfell himself sought financial assistance in the United States, in Britain, and in Canada. His stories were sincere and heartwarming and filled with the simplicity of greatness. Soon widespread supporting associations came into being and funds were forthcoming which kept the work of the Labrador doctor growing. Hospitals were set up at Cartwright, St. Anthony, Northwest River and Harrington. Nursing stations were built at Canada Bay, Flowers Cove, Forteau, Mutton Bay and St. Mary's River and a children's home at St. Anthony. Throughout his long, happy, adventurous life, Sir Wilfred Grenfell won friends and support for the mission. And though he died more than 10 years ago, Sir Wilfred is a living presence on the coast today. Not long after he began work, Grenfell chose as mission headquarters the landlocked harbor of St. Anthony near the northern tip of Newfoundland. 
Near the fishing village, he chose a site for the mission building. His own house stands on the side of the hill. Near the harbor is the United Church. Between the well-equipped hospital and the shore is the Grenfell Memorial Cooperative Store, which Sir Wilfred set up to help the coast fishermen get better prices for their catch. Near the buildings, the mission has its own wharf, dry dock, and warehouses. Above the harbor, the children's home stands on a grassy hill, and near it, the residence of the superintendent of the International Grenfell Association. To the children's home in St. Anthony come boys and girls from the long stretch of coast that the mission serves. Some children have lost their fathers in storms at sea. One child is being cared for because his mother is in the TB ward of the hospital. One boy's father was frozen to death crossing the barrens. A few children are under observation after being in hospital. Some are orphans who have lost both parents through illness or accident. And many come to receive an education at the school at St. Anthony. Many of these children had not seen a cow till they came to St. Anthony. The older boys help tend the fine Holstein dairy herd and work in the barns and hen houses. Milk, eggs, meat and vegetables make good healthy meals for hospital patients and the children of the home. With improvement in health comes better spirits and lots of smiles. In the Mission Clothing Store, bales are received from the United States, Canada, and Great Britain, containing clothes, linens, and blankets, prepared and donated by needlework guilds and charitable individuals and groups. Here, volunteer workers sort them onto shelves ready for distribution. The people pay for these articles by the returns from handicrafts made at home or in the industrial shop, and by manual labor about the Mission establishments. They make skin boots, mittens, hooked rugs, and embroidered parkas. They pick berries, bring in firewood and fish. Many individuals have been helped by the mission to learn specific trades. One Labrador man, Wilfred Mesher, is chief mechanic, electrician, and shipwright, and has run the mission haul-up slip and the machine shop for many years. He was sent outside, that is, off the coast, for his training. Like him, another coast man, Ted McNeil, was sent outside for training. McNeil is foreman of construction and supervised local labor in the building of the reservoir dam. On all projects, McNeil values highly the advice of the able superintendent of the International Grenfell Association, Dr. Charles S. Curtis, chosen successor to Dr. Grenfell. I was in the dam today, Ted, and I was wondering what that piece of... Uh uh, concrete you poured yesterday was far. Oh, that's the north abutment, the end of the main concrete dam. Do you think there's enough gravel up on that site to uh, finish the job? It looks to me though we're running short. Yes, I think we're going to need more. There's a place in Conception Bay where they have a stone crushing plant. Originally from Massachusetts, Dr. Curtis has worked ceaselessly for the mission since 1917. He is the executive head of the entire Grenfell mission and its chief surgeon and physician. He is assisted by a devoted staff of physicians, such as Dr. Thomas, who here talks with old Mr. Pilgrim from St. Anthony Bight. A story typical of the coast is the one Mrs. Patey has to tell. Tell me about your eye, Miss Patey. Which is the bad one? The right one, sir. How long has it been bad? Three years. Is it blind? Right blind, total blind. How about your other eye? Well, I can see a little with him, but not good. Not able to do any work? Not able to do any sewing much or knitting. Can't make any skin boots now? Oh, no, sir. I'm sorry to say I can't make no more boots now. 
I've made some hundreds of pairs. How long since you've been making boots? Well, sir, I made the first pair when I was 13 years old. Made them for myself. Is that right? Mm -hmm. I'd like to know if you can see light. Can you see any light? Oh, uh, no, sir, not a, a no, light. not a glimmer, sir. I not see. a glimmer. You've been in St. No. Anthony uh, quite a long time, haven't you? 30, 31 years. Is that so? Yeah. Who brought you here first? Sir Wilfred. Oh, did yes, he? Sir. Where were you? David Inlet, oh. Labrador. I see. You're a widow, aren't you? Big pardon. You were a widow, weren't yes, you? Yes, sir, I was a widow. I was a widow twice for a doctor. Oh, you were. And how many children did you have? Seven. Seven. And you ran your own trap line? Yes, sir. Done all that. Cut down me wooden the winter and pulled it. Your own self? My own self. Of course, it was near, see. But then it's hard work for a woman. In the winter, I lived all alone, my children and I. Five miles were the nearest people to me. Is that right? That's right, sir, that's right. You worked in the hospital for a while, didn't you? I worked in the laundry for a month, and I had to go up to the orphanage, sir. Well, for ordered me there when the children were all sick with I influenza. I see. And then I went to the hospital. Uh, yeah. I stayed there and worked there all that winter. In the spring, I went with Dr. Curtis. I see. Doctors from St. Anthony make calls to the homes of fishermen as far away as 100 miles along the coast. And when winter freezes the bays and sea ice clogs the shores and makes travel by boat impossible, the Grenfell doctor makes his calls by dog team. As he drives to distant fishing villages, he carries his medicine chest on his comatic. When he sees the doctor coming over the hard-packed snow toward his house, an anxious father comes out to welcome him. When the call is finished, the doctor helps clear the traces. And then the team is off again to another outport. Travel by dog team is strenuous, lonely, and often dangerous. Like all wilderness travel, it depends a lot on the weather. In times of deep snow, the doctor often snowshoes ahead all day. When it's 40 below, he runs half the time to keep from freezing. Nights on the trail, he sleeps in some hunter's cabin or tent banked deep in snow or on some settler's kitchen floor. His day's call's over, Dr. Salter returns to the big main hospital at St. Anthony. There's always a friendly greeting at the only hospital in all of northern Newfoundland. Patients come here from many remote places by coastal steamer and schooner in the summer, by dog team in the winter. They receive excellent food and the best of care in ideal surroundings. The 120-bed institution is rated A1 by the American College of Surgeons. The job of splitting fish causes septic fingers, a common ailment. The scourge of the coast, and still the most prevalent disease, is tuberculosis. TB accounts for more than 40% of the beds in the hospital. To diagnose and treat tubercular patients, the hospital has complete x-ray facilities and fully equipped operating rooms. The hospital, built by local labor assisted by college student volunteers, has never turned away a needy patient. Many of the assistants are coast girls who have been trained by the mission. The Grenfell nurses are drawn from England, the United States, Canada, and other parts of the world. A former head nurse was a northern Newfoundland girl who had been sent outside for training.
the children's ward has many pitiful cases which show the ravages of tuberculosis of the bone Is it any wonder that the facilities of the Grenfell Hospital at St. Anthony are looked on with such pride and gratitude by the coast people? Convalescent patients and others too crippled to fish or hunt learn in the industrial shop to fashion the artistic handicrafts for which the coast has become famous. Ivory carving, rug braiding and hooking, weaving and knitting, are some of the activities carried on in homes as well as hospitals. The mission has developed market outlets for the colorful products made by these skilled hands. The Grenfell Mission was instrumental in establishing non-denominational schools along the coast. The administration of the schools has recently been assumed by local boards of education, but the mission still takes a keen interest in the education of the coast children. Local children and those from the home attend the big St. Anthony School, which will carry them right through the high school grade. The religion of this seafaring people is devout, simple, and direct. The church is the focal point of their spiritual and social life. Sir Wilfred himself, as a lay reader, was a source of religious inspiration to all throughout his life. With the arrival of early summer, ships and boats begin to run again. Among the first to arrive with freight from Montreal or St. John's is the mission vessel Cluett. Workhorse of the mission fleet, she will soon be off carrying long-awaited supplies to the outlying stations, most of which were frozen in the previous November. One of the small mission hospital vessels is the Albert T. Gould, well equipped to carry doctors and patients in the areas adjacent to the Straits of Belle Isle. Another member of the fleet makes a medical voyage the length of the Labrador each summer. She is the diesel-powered Merivale. The arrival of the Merivale at a nursing station is an important event. The one at St. Mary's River is typical of the five run by the Grenfell Mission. Nurse Jupp is in charge here. As she is on her own throughout the year, the visit of the coast doctor is most welcome. Nurse Jupp is responsible for an area extending almost 100 miles along the coast and must make trips by boat or dog team to visit patients who cannot be moved. At the station, she runs the 16-bed hospital, an outpatient clinic and dispensary. She also supervises handicrafts among the patients. Maternity cases, dental work, and emergency surgery are all part of her responsibility. Local people do much to help the nurse around the buildings. Sam Ackerman has been working for the mission most of his life. During the brief summer, Nurse Jupp grows a fine garden, and somehow all year round she finds time to encourage community activities. Welcome as she is, the Marivelle cannot stop for long. She has a thousand miles of coast to cruise. Leaving St. Mary's River, the Marivelle sails north, making many stops at tiny harbors. Sometimes a hail from a group of fishing dories will bring the vessel to anchor while Dr. Padden performs a dental extraction. 
the grenfell doctors and nurses often have to perform specialized emergency operations over the years many dentists i physicians and other specialists have come to spend their summers aboard grenfell boats treating the people of the coast to navigate in and out of the crooked tickles and reef strewn anchorages the Maravel skipper needs to be a master pilot. There are no lights, no boys, only a few rock cairns on the hills as bearing markers. When the Maravel drops anchor in a narrow tickle, the people of the fishing village come down to their boats. Soon a flotilla of dories, skiffs and rowboats is making for the side of the hospital ship. Men, women, and children of all ages come aboard. Most important, of course, is the visit to the doctor. But then there's news, too, and sometimes mail or messages from the last port of call. A fishing schooner passes on the port beam as the Marival steams north again to Cartwright. When she enters harbor, she passes salmon packers transferring cargo. The freighter Kyle is in and everybody's busy. She is Labrador's most important link with the world. The Kyle is the coastal steamer making round trips down the Labrador with freight passengers, mail, and patients during the summer months. When her whistle blows in the outer harbor, it's like a herald's trumpet. Tenders and lighters soon cluster round her, taking on and discharging cargo. On this trip, she has brought a distinguished visitor to Cartwright. Dr. Forsyth from the Cartwright Hospital escorts the Bishop of Newfoundland ashore. The Grenfell Hospital at Cartwright has 20 beds and is fitted with x-ray equipment. Here too, patients are encouraged to carry on crafts to help defray the cost of their care. Then the Marivelle steams up Hamilton Inlet to the most northerly of the Grenfell stations located at Northwest River. she gets a rousing welcome from a group of mission workers. Each year, many college students serve as volunteer workers at the various mission stations. These young men and women are workers without pay, nicknamed WAPs, and they help with land clearing, stevedoring, and building. Without this great army of volunteer aid, much that has been done would have been impossible. In his home hospital, Dr. Padden attends to a young Indian girl with TB of the spine. Across the river from the town is the Indian encampment. Each summer, nomadic Nascopi Indians pitch camp here for six weeks. Some of them seek and obtain medical aid from the mission. The Nascopi Indians live almost entirely by hunting and trapping, and with the coming of fall, push inland to the haunts of the beaver and the caribou. They are a shy and colorful people. Peculiar to the Nascapi is the small wooden peg around which the women tie their hair over their ears. The men, on the other hand, have succumbed to the simplicity of a more civilized hairdo. The biggest social event of the year at Northwest River is the fair on July 1st. 
people come from miles around including nearby goose bay airport highlight of the fair is the auction sale of goods made by the people themselves proceeds from the sale are contributed to the support of the mission dr patton here takes on the role of auctioneer Volunteer workers assist at the various tables. Helping at one booth is Jack Watts, foreman at Northwest River. Man of the coast, troubleshooter, wireless operator, mechanic and builder, Watts is a tower of strength in the community. The Northwest River gardener, Ellis Michelin, was trained by the mission. He tends the garden where the vegetables for the hospital are grown, and he manages the greenhouse. When Grenfell found rickets, scurvy, and berry berries so widespread, and found the coast people living on salt fish, white bread, molasses, and tea, he determined to improve their diets. Each year, thousands upon thousands of young cabbage plants are distributed by the greenhouse to the fishermen. Many parts of the coast are far too rugged to make even the simplest gardening worthwhile. But where the soil is sufficient, the subarctic summer grows bumper crops of carrots, spinach, turnips, lettuce, and potatoes. The use of green vegetables has succeeded in almost wiping out the diseases of malnutrition. Each summer, the Merivale makes a trip further north along the Labrador to provide medical assistance to people on that isolated coast. At Davis Inlet, a small group of the Nascapi tribe come out to the Merivale by canoe. After treatment, the patients paddle ashore, and once more, the Merivale turns north. At Nain, one of the larger settlements in the region, Dr. Padden performs a tonsillectomy on board the Maravel. Dr. Anthony Padden was born on the coast. His father, Dr. Harry Padden, himself served the mission on the Labrador for 30 years and used to make the medical trips aboard the Maravel and the long winter cometic journeys that his son does now. Along the length of the coast, fishing schooners find shelter to work the catch of cod they have taken in the open sea. Again underway, the Maravel travels the rugged shore north to Hebron. Hebron is the most northerly community of any size on the Labrador. The minister of the Moravian Church comes aboard to visit the dispensary. Beyond Hebron, the Maravel turns north again to Saglek Bay. This is Eskimo country, vast, treeless, bleak, and yet somehow providing a living for these resourceful people. As elsewhere on this lonely coast, the arrival of the Grenfell doctor in the mission boat is a truly wonderful event. Along over a thousand miles of the coasts of Labrador and northern Newfoundland, the Grenfell mission carries on its work of medical and social service. For more than half a century, it has brought doctors and the world's friendship to the rugged, heroic people of the coast. And it has brought them a chance to help themselves which in turn has wrought miracles. The little mission vessel is a symbol of physical and spiritual strength among the deep sea fishers. <laughs>